Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining our uh, group colloquium at uh, WMG. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Niels Wonken, uh, who is currently Associate Professor at School of Metallurgy and Materials, uh, University of Birmingham. Uh, Niels completed his undergraduate as well as PhD in Metallurgical Engineering from uh, RWTH Aachen University in Germany. Since 2000, he worked as a member of Microstructure Modeling Group at the privately funded research lab in Aachen, uh, being involved in the development of uh, Microsoftware package, which is a commercial phase field software work package. In 2007, Niels moved to University of Birmingham to start a postdoctoral position. Since 2011, he has been a faculty member and is now currently associate professor. Niels has authored various scientific publications uh, and his expertise is in microstructural modeling of solidification, oxidation and uh, microstructural development. Today, Niels is going to present his talk on phase field modeling of microstructure formation in multi-component alloys. Niels, thank you very much for your time and floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I've provided a little outline on my talk. Initially, I'd like to provide some um, motivation of why we're doing this, why, where we're coming from, and also frame my research interest a little bit. I, I will mostly focus on phase transformation of metals. I will not talk about oxidation this time, but um, you will see from the motivation where we're coming from. I will then provide some background and introduce the phase field method as it's currently very, very widely used in a rather pragmatic way. And um, without going through all of the details of and the um, derivation of the equations, um, I think I have a way of introducing it to someone who's not coming from a theoretical physics, um, physics side, but um, from a more practical metallurgical side. I will present a number of examples quite a lot, in fact. Um, some of them I might go through a bit quicker in the interest of time, because in the end, I'd like to introduce some recent developments going on in Birmingham, um, something I've been working on for quite some time, which is now coming to a point where getting the first results, the first simulations, and um, hopefully finish, complete a paper fairly soon um, on that development. Before I start, there's a lot of people that I've been working with over the year, and that was a real privilege. Um, I'm not going to read out all the names. Um, I, I know I've seen some of the names um, in the in the list of attendees. Um, some are not here. Um, and and um, a lot of the things that are in here would probably look a bit different or not even made it into this presentation had it not been for without interaction of all these amazing people. Um, recently, however, I um, had some very fruitful interactions with um, a couple of people, especially two PhD students, Besha Mitchell, which is currently writing up, Michael Johnson, who finished his PhD last year. Um, lots of discussions on phase field and the, the last part of this talk um, was very, very closely linked to what they did in their PhDs. And currently, there's a lot of discussions and conversations that are very, very helpful and fruitful. Um, Laszlo Sturz, who I meet on a regular basis, um, Daniela Reschke, Zoe, Jack, uh, and Clive, just to mention a few. Um, for some of these interactions, it's not always something where I can just pinpoint, okay, this is exactly their contribution, but still, this was all very important. So, where we're we coming from? Well, we've been processing materials for quite some time and, and we've been doing micro well, not microstructure process modeling and processing for quite a long time as well it's it's a very very common industrial practice right now when i started out on my journey into microstructure modeling the the bridging the gap from the large scale simulations as for this turbine blade towards prediction of the microstructure was a major undertaking it was still a big challenge um, and um, the, the mere question, how do we actually predict the microstructures and the multi-component alloy, was one 
it was on the mind of a few people. For a lot of people, it wasn't even something that had started thinking about. And to me, this had always had a very, very big fascination because if we can bridge that gap, if we can actually get to the point that we predict microstructures, we need to be in a position where we understood a lot in the underlying physics and what controls the microstructure formation in the first place. Let me give you a couple of examples, and this is something I, now um, I'm presenting that I've been working on for quite a long time. So let's say we look into the thermal, the, the history of a turbine blade in the microstructure evolution. Well, here's an example of a turbine blade on, on the top right corner. After casting, we would see typically a dendritic structure as we see in this micrograph here. Notice the length scale, this is about 100 micrometers down here. So we have the typical cross shape of the dendrites and the secondary phases in between the dendrites. Then we go through a solution heat treatment. At the lower left, we have a schematic of the temperature time profile during processing. So the microstructure has been homogenized. We see, still see some shades of the dendrites. If you find there's some area which is slightly brighter, this is a bit darker and if we look closely we still can make out some of the cross shapes of the dendrites in there. So never completely homogenizes. So how do we simulate formation of the dendritic structure and then the homogenization? After homogenization there's an aging heat treatment and we find that on a much smaller scale, now that length bar is just one micrometer, we find this typical brick and mortar structure evolving. All of that is governed, of course, by very similar physics, physics of transport, thermodynamics, and so on, but happens on very, very different length scales. How can we simulate this? What, what, is, what do we need to do in order to understand the formation of these structures? Here's another example. There's meant to be a video starting here. There we go. So, this is a very classical way of studying microstructure formation. This is a transparent model system studying direction solidification. We have a lower temperature at the left, a high temperature on the right, and the sample is moved through the temperature field while observed through a microscope. So we see a direct view on the uh, microstructures it's forming in situ and can derive some understanding from that. So what we're aiming at is very much having a computer model for this type of process where we can solve the corresponding equations, dig deep into the physics and to predict this rather complex pattern that's emerging during processing. And there's a number of challenges associated with that. So what do we need in order to describe microstructure formation? So the end result would be a computer calculated image similar to the one on the top. Well, of course, what's very important is the thermodynamics and the phase diagram that results from the thermodynamics of the system. So here's an example of nickel, chromium, aluminium. And once we start mixing them, we all know that very complex things can happen. Phases form, phases show different solubility. This is actually a very simple phase diagram for a ternary system, but it can get a lot more complicated. But just describing that interaction between the elements, the chemical elements, is rather challenging task in its own right. On top of that, in order to introduce the kinetics, we need to introduce the fusion because that describes the redistribution of our, of our um, sorry, chemical elements. The fusion, or in case of solidification, also fluid flow. So that gives us a time scale. But then also we have to introduce a length scale and we'd like to predict the morphology as well. So we have to describe the movement of the interface that this, uh, separates the growing crystals in this case, which are the yellow um, trees, the dendrites, from the surrounding liquid, giving us liquid, uh, sorry, as blue in this illustration. All of these three have to come together and coupled in the right way to give the correct interplay to actually describe the microstructure formation that we've got up there. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to address that? I'd like to introduce the classical approach first, and this is very much a view that seems to be very obvious when we go back towards the um, transparent model system, where we had a very clearly defined interface between the solid and the liquid phase. So here we have an illustration of, for example, a solid, which would be red, and the liquid phase in blue. And 
we can then use the phase diagram. That's a classic hypertological way look of looking at it and work out for a given temperature, what's the composition of the liquid, what's the composition of the solid. In equilibrium, we can also work out the fractions, but we very quickly find if we want to describe microstructure, we need a slightly different approach to equilibrium. So, <clears throat> however, the phase diagram tells us the composition of the first phase and the second phase, so the solid and the liquid at the interface. Um, so assume that the phase diagram is liquid, uh, sorry, valid along the, the, the white line as it's shown here. Then we need to describe diffusion. And in the simplest case, we would use fixed first equation combined with um, continuity. It would then lead to a fixed second equation, and that would give us a really good description of the diffusion in our system. And now, knowing where this interface is present, that dividing white line is incredibly useful because that will allow us to separate diffusion from the solid, from diffusion and liquid. Because now the diffusion coefficients are different, diffusion doesn't that easily trans move across the, the phase boundary, um, or if it does, it would definitely change the um, diffusion kinetics. So numerically, in order to separate the two and the two diffusion in two different domains, we need to know where the phase boundary lies, because that's the dividing line. But then we want to describe the evolution of the phase and the morphology. That means we need to describe the movement of the interface as well, indicated by all these little arrows. And each point in the interface might move at a different rate. It might change direction due to buckling and bulging of the interface. And all of that interplaying will give us the morphology of the, of the structure. Classically, we can describe the velocity of the interface locally, um, and that's proportional to the difference of diffusion on both sides of the interface. So that's diffusion in phase one, diffusion in phase two, the difference of that next to the interface will describe the velocity of the interface. However, you, sorry, and if we do that, we will end up with an equation like that, and that would give us the magnitude of all these arrows. It will, however, not tell us which direction the interface will be moving, whether there's going to be some per, um, protrusions in there, some perturbations, and whether the interface will change direction. So describing the actual morphology, therefore, becomes a lot more complicated than that. So we would have to discretize this. In 1D, this is relatively simple because the, the interface has only one way to move. In 2D, this gets very complicated. In 3D, it's close to impossible. Numerically, this is a massively big challenge. So can we come up with a better way? Well, we can, and this is what phase field is about. This is where the phase field method comes in. The phase field method starts with the same, um, from, a, from a similar point, knowing that we have the difference in composition given somewhat by the phase diagrams or the underlying thermodynamics. We describe diffusion, uh, other methods of uh, means of transport in the two phases. But then we also introduce an extra order parameter, an extra parameter that's not present in the sharp interface model. And so we have two order parameters, phi beta and phi alpha for the two different phases. They are linked, they always add up to one, so we get away with just modeling one, but they are indicator functions, and that's very important to indicate whether any point in space is part of the beta phase or part of the alpha phase, okay? So order parameter phi beta is one um, inside the red area and zero inside the blue area, and vice versa, order parameter phi alpha is one in the blue area and zero in the red area. In between the two, we now have a region, which is the interface, where we see a smooth transition from between zero and one. So phi beta would change from zero to one, sorry, from one to zero as we move from red to blue, and um, vice versa for phi alpha. And that makes the traction of the interface movement much, much simpler. I appreciate this might not be immediately obvious why this is making this simpler and why this is a good approach to do so. I would ask your patience, I will show you in a moment how that actually works and how we can use these order parameters in order to describe the evolution of the faces and the movement of the interface. Um, so finally, in order to do that, 
to describe the evolution of the order parameters, we also need to know the free energy or the energy in the, in the two phases, alpha and beta. And so we introduce the thermodynamics into the system in a way that we haven't for the sharp interface system before. So ask you for a moment of patience, understand in order to um, see how the order parameter works, why it's describing the movement of the interface. For me, the Mexican wave is a perfect analogy of how the, how the order permit actually operates. Imagine you're in a stadium, all the spectators are on their seats. The only movements are between seated and standing position. The wave moves exclusively or entirely because spectators jump up, stand for a moment and sit down again. So none of the spectators move their, leave their seats. Each spectator is a discrete point in space and the state of the spectator, whether they're seated or standing, is an indication whether they're part of the peak of the wave or part of the trough, or in other words, whether they are within the wave or outside the wave. Phase field works exactly in the same way. We introduce the order parameter. It is zero at places where a phase is not present and it's one where the phase is there. And we can switch the value of the order parameter to indicate that the point in space has actually changed state from being outside the phase to be inside the phase. But the analogy doesn't stop there. If we look closely at the Mexican wave, there's always something like two or three spectators at the leading edge of the wave, which is somewhere between seated and standing. There's never a sharp transition. There's always a certain width of, the, of that leading edge. At the same at the trailing edge, there's always a few spectators somewhere between standard and seating. So it takes them a while to sit down and before they sit down, the next person has started um, to sit down as well. So the both edges of the Mexican wave are diffuse. They're not a sharp line, but there's something that's somewhat smeared out um, over a number of points. And this is exactly the way how we also describe the evolution of the order parameter in the phase field. There's always a few points which are neither bike of one phase nor bike of the other phase, but they're somewhere in between and they're somewhere in the interface. Also, if you're a spectator in there, you find seated is a very comfortable position and standing isn't too bad either. So this is two energy minima, but being somewhere in between in a crotch position, somewhere between seated and standing is a rather strenuous exercise. It's something we don't like to be in in that state. So there's an energy penalty involved with being part of the leading edge or part of the trailing edge. This is why no one stays that way. They always go, okay, I transition to standing or I transition to seated, but they try to get past that stage as quickly as possible. And this is exactly the same as in phase field where the order parameter, if it's somewhere between zero and one, creates a penalty for being outside the bike and being at an interface or being part of an interface. And that um, relates to the interfacial energy. So in other words, next time you're in the stadium, you see the Mexican wave, don't think about face field, but enjoy the spectacle. But still, this is a really good representation in my view on what face field does and how it works. So let me bring my pointer back. So how does that work mathematically? Don't worry, I will not go too deeply into that. The derivation of the phase field method starts with what's called the free energy function. This is not, I repeat, not at all related to the density functional theory. Um, it still uses the mathematical tool of a functional and it uses the free energy. So what it describes is actually free energy within a given volume and how that free energy is distributed. So let's say we have a volume of a given size. We find that in volume, the volume can vary in concentration in, or composition, it can vary in temperature, and the order parameter can vary. All three will affect the free energy. Also, if we have a great variation in order parameter, there's going to be some transitions. And that transition is being um, represented by looking at the gradient of the order parameter. So if the gradient of the order parameter is present, that creates an energy penalty related to the free, um, to the interfacial energy of the system. If we now integrate all of that 
in space over um, in space we find that gives us the free energy of the system if we expand the functions we get an expression like this so we expanded the um, expression for the free energy finding there's another term in there for being for a penalty term for being somewhere between zero and one so between as being part of the interface plus the unaffected um, free energies of the um, um, depending on composition of the various phases. So interestingly, we find if we're in the bike and then say all other parameters either zero or one and shows no gradient, all the, two, all the terms which involve five are going to vanish and we go back to simple um, description of the free energy of a, of a single phase. If we now take that function, perform something that's called the variation and derivative described by this delta, delta or by delta phi of the free energy functional. I um, can use that shortcut to that. I'm not go I'm going through that rather rapidly um, because I'd like to get onto other things. Um, so we end up with an equation like this. And this is what we quite often refer to as the phase field equation. And that describes the evolution of the order parameter as a function of space and time, okay? So that's exactly what we want. We want to describe how the order parameter changes any point in space as a function of time. That equation, of course, is something, well, I can imagine a few people shying away from that and say, oh, this, this looks rather complex. Let me give you an idea of where this is coming from, what the different terms do. We have three terms in that equation. The first term is similar to fixed diffusion equation, fixed second equation. If we solve just that term alone, we get what we see in the animation down there. We're starting from a step, we will smooth out the step and ensure that we get the same order parameter everywhere. So it's just equally distributing the order parameter across space. This is a bit like having a slope and then we got these little pebbles rolling down the slope until well, that, that pile has decreased quite significantly in height. This is not exactly what we want because we want the order parameter to indicate the position of an interface and transition from one phase to the other. If we just use this term alone, we would find that we have interface everywhere and no bulk. So we need to stabilize this. So we're employing someone who's just shoveling all the pebbles back up the hill, okay? So they're going back up there. So we remove something on the left-hand side and we add something on the, sorry, on the right-hand side and we add this up on the, on the left-hand side. So, this is what the second term does, one minus phi times, and so on and so on. Okay, so what we've achieved now is we've got two terms. One is describing the smearing out of the interface, and the other one is stopping the interface from smearing out indefinitely. There's an extra term in there, which I will come to in a moment. First, I'd like to illustrate what the first two terms do. If we apply just the first two terms to a situation like this, where we had a randomly wavy interface with just like lots of columns um, at some random order, and that order was clearly definitely um, um, generated using a random number generator. We find that all the perturbations with the short wavelength will die out first, and we end up with just one wavelength, um, one perturbation with the same wavelength of the, as the width of our domain. So the first two terms together are very efficient at stabilizing the interface and smoothing out the interface as well. So removing everything that creates curvature and, and therefore overall minimizing interfacial energy. And we could actually evaluate from this that as, we, as time progresses in that system, as we see it in the animation here, we got less and less interface present. If put into the appropriate context, we can actually use the first two terms alone to simulate grain growth. Here's a situation with a number of grains, each color representing a different grain. They're interacting entirely through the first two terms and we eliminate a lot of grains. And if we look closely, we would just actually see all the things that we were taught as undergraduates and saying, okay, grains with six sides remain stable, more than six sides, um, they grow, and with less than six sides, they shrink. And, and this is really coming out of the simulation. And we see that as grains disappear, some grains that had initially been growing suddenly become unstable and start to disappear as well. So I, I, I watched this many times and I can still watch it over and over again. So 
that was grain growth and just smoothing of interface, but no transformation as such. There wasn't any transformation from one phase to the other. So everything we've looked at was, well, the grain growth is definitely just one phase. We have this extra term in there, and that brings on the thermodynamics of the phase transformation. So we have a delta G in there, which is actually the change in free energy if a phase transforms from one into the other. This is a bit like employing someone else who's just pushing that boundary forwards and backwards, depending on which on the sign of the of the of the um, driving force delta G. So if we bring all of this together and couple this to transport processes, we can actually start simulating microstructure formation. I will not go through the coupling to diffusion in here in the interest of time. I'd just like to move on and show you some examples. So here's the um, solidification of a binary system. This is a hypothetical system. There's more demonstrator simulation. In this case, we have a seed. We start growing. We started fairly high under cooling. Everything that's black is solid and everything that's color is liquid. So we see a slight pile up ahead of the moving interface. We find the interface breaks up and forms these deep channels with enriched liquid, and, and we form what's typically called a seaweed structure. We also see that there's no preferred growth direction. This grows almost like a sphere, except for the, the perturbations at the interface formed by the channels. This is the case where the interfacial energy has been treated as isotropic. So there's no preferred orientation of the interfacial energy, meaning the interfacial energy doesn't have any minima for specific crystallographic directions. If we introduce just a few percent of variation in the interfacial energy and leave everything else exactly the same as in the previous simulation, we get exactly this. Suddenly we get a dendrite. These are the dendrites we've seen from solidification science over and over again showing preferred growth direction, aligning to the 100 direction, forming side arms, which then again grow along 100. But apart from that, showing the same segregation pattern, like a slight pileup, and, and the, the deep channels, which absorb some of the um, highly enriched liquid. So we have a tool that can actually capture quite a lot of effects already. Okay. So what are we getting if we apply this to different situations? Sorry. So here we're going back to that transparent and transparent model system. I'd like to point out that is a demonstrator simulation again. It's it's not modeling exactly the same alloy or the transparent model system as we see in the in the, in the micrograph, but um, it's solidifying under similar conditions. So we see initially here we got two grains with different orientations. Um, one perfectly aligned to the um, heat flux direction. We got high temperature on the right, low temperature at the left. Again, the growing crystals are black, and there's a black layer as well, which is lick on, on head of the solidification front, which is liquid that has not been affected by the segregation of elements. So we found the typical patterns, the dendrite tips forming, there's a new primary that has been forming, side arms forming, um, and all that grain selection that's, that we typically see as well in the experiments. Um, or using the organic model systems. So we now have a tool that actually well, convincingly um, gives very, very similar patterns and that allows us to study these patterns and predict some of that and where we could just now do studies on what happens if we change something. Okay. Let's apply this now to actual alloys. Um, because the, the, the talk is titled multi-component alloys and everything we looked at so far was either a pure substance or a binary alloy. So the interest is actually going multi-component and look into alloys which are technically more relevant than those systems we already looked at. How do we do that? Well, this is schematic here. I'm not yet going into the details how the coupling is done, but the idea is that we have the morphology from phase field. We have the diffusion equation, which in the simplest case would be fixed equation or a thermodynamic formulation thereof. And now we substitute the phase diagram to thermodynamic calculations using something like the Kaifert approach. Kaifert approach is actually a very good approach for that. So we incorporate the Gibbs energies and minimization of Gibbs energy in order to inform our phase field model, how the alloying elements will partition between the different phases, creating the segregation we've already seen, how we get driving forces, 
in order to describe the evolution of morphology and also how we nucleate new phases and then have secondary phases forming. That's describing the material side. But we can now couple this to process modeling as well. So we can, can get, for example, temperature time profiles coming out of a casting simulation and temperature time profiles coming out of a heat treatment simulations. And all of that we've done at some stage, saying that, yeah, process modeling is something that's fairly well developed, but we can feed this into our phase field model and then predict the microstructure evolution under realistic conditions within a rather complex material. So what I'd like to show is something similar to what we see at the bottom, showing that you're going through casting and then subsequent solution heat treatment and look at the microstructure evolution. I've given some of that away here, but we're going to look a little bit more into detail. Here is, for example, the rhenium pattern um, that we would get from solidification of CMS-610. CMS-610 is a rather complex alloy. It's got about nine major alloying elements. So elements. So this alloy, this simulation has been done indeed for the full composition and complexity of CMS-610. So we could draw similar images for all of the other alloying elements, aluminium, cobalt, chromium, tantalum, tungsten, um, rhenium, titanium. I think I captured them all. Um, cobalt I missed. So, but because this one is giving a very clear representation of the microstructure evolution we're seeing, I've chosen to present rhenium only. And so we have, we we'll look at the cross section of a directional solidifying um, dendritic array. We have a number of dendrites in there. We initially see the dendrites growing. These were the positions of the dendrite tips, then the growth in the cross section, forming side arms, enrichment of rhenium inside the dendrite core, and then finally, single nucleation of the gamma prime phase, which is then forming these blue dots at the end of the solidification and decorating the, um, the, the dendrites and the microstructure. If we do this for a simple alloy, simple in terms it has only five alloying elements, nickel, aluminium, chromine, tantalum, and tungsten, we get patterns like this. And for this alloy, we have actually made some alloy, direction solidified, and then used WDS to map out the elemental concentrations in a quantitative manner. And then done some relations for exactly the same alloy composition and the same process conditions as well. And what we end up with is what we see here. So we got aluminium first, chromium second, tantalum, and then followed by tungsten. So we find that aluminium and tantalum show very similar segregation patterns. So the element enriches in the liquid and depletes within the solid. But in aluminium, the segregation profile is spread out a bit further. Aluminium diffuses within the solid phase by about an order of magnitude faster than tantalum. So we have a lot more diffusion going on during the solidification stage. We see then the gamma prime forming in between the dendrite arms as well, but we're not forming an awful lot of gamma prime. It's about 1% or so. And all of that agrees quite well with the measured segregation patterns. We have the position and the concentration of the gamma prime is correct. The segregation pattern is correct. Then the smeared outness of the segregation profile and the difference between aluminum and tantalum we find. We also find that chromium enriches in the, in the, in the liquid initially and then gets rejected very heavily by the gamma prime. So we have the maximum chromium concentration here and the minimum close to that inside the gamma prime phase. We find that the same pattern we find in the, in the experiment as well. And then finally, we got tungsten. Tungsten segregate towards the dendrite, the gamma phase initially, so it enriches on the dendrite core and keeps depleting. And then gamma prime nucleates and doesn't dissolve any tantalum, uh, sorry, tungsten either. Um, so that's rejected even further, and we see that represented in both the simulation and the experiment. So we're actually quite happy with the agreement there and confident that at least for this type of alloys, we can do these calculations for a fairly complex alloy. Just to show off a little bit, phase field, of course, is very powerful doing 2D, but we can also move to a 3D simulation. So here we have a slice of a dendrite. And, um, and form dendrite almonds net. And if we look at the bottom, so this is for the same alloy as, as in the previous slide, but this time we just look at tungsten. And so if we have the um, segregation map at the bottom, we find that here the segregation uh, pattern is slightly more complex. And we also find that the gamma prime phase are almost like bobbits on the Christmas trees hanging between the branches. <laughs> So these alloys are typically solution heat treated. There's a region 
um, below the, the um, solidus temperature and before the gamma prime solidus temperature, where the alloy is exclusively single phase gamma. And typically, we heat up the alloy into that temperature range in order to homogenize the alloy. Um, so we've done simulations from that going through a multi step heat treatment. So going up, this is initially the ours is the ASCA structure. Here we're looking at the tungsten distribution. Ramping up through a number of steps after four and a half hours, we find yeah some diffusion going on. We homogenize it slightly. The gamma prime is still present. After 10 hours, the gamma prime is gone, and then diffusion continues to um, homogenize the material. But we find that even after 18 hours, time and temperature weren't um, enough to completely eradicate the, the, the tungsten segregation profile. So there's still going to be slight compositional variation even after 18 hours of heat treatment, going up to 13, 20 degrees C, so which is quite warm. So and if we then evaluate the amount of gamma prime present in the microstructure over time, we end up with this graph. So here the um, closed symbols correspond to the solid line and the open symbols to the dashed line. We find that initially upon heating up, the gamma prime is not um, dissolving very quickly. So I should say the lines coming from the simulations while the symbols come from some experiments. Um, the error bars look huge, but this is the standard deviation of determining the gamma prime from the micrographs. And the gamma prime fraction is not very large. We find this is about 1.5%. So the error bars are actually not very large, but relative to the amount of gamma prime, they appear very, very massive. But we find overall, and that's, that's the important thing, that the trend of the dissolution um, for the different temperatures, 1285 and 1295, is very, very similar. Finding that 1285, we have something like an incubation period before the dissolution kicks in, and then we see a very rapid um, drop in gamma prime fraction. Where for 1295, we have a very uh, early onset of dissolution, so we end up after three hours with a much, much smaller fraction gamma prime. If we now go to a different length scale and use very much the same tool, but um, so the same software, but now it's also coupled to coherency stresses and simulating the stress distribution between the particles and then simulates the nucleation growth and costing of the gamma prime particles during the aging heat treatment, we end up with a result like this. I should say this is again for SCA 425, which is another commercial alloy and taking into, allow, into account the full complexity of the alloy. It is not quite as complex as CMS 610, but it gets close. So we find that initially gamma prime is forming, nucleating, growing, and as the particles grow, they build up a stress field due to current difference in, in lattice parameter between the gamma and the gamma prime phase. And that stress field actually causes the gamma prime particles to align in rows and columns so that we end up with this brick and mortar type structure that we normally see in the micrographs as well. But it takes a time to develop. And down here is a micrograph, so it's a rather qualitative comparison, I, I admit, but we find that the final structure um, shows very similar appearance than the one we see in the micrograph. Um, here's the work we've done. Oh, I'd like to get to the final bit in there, but um, of the presentation. Here's some work we've done a few years ago where we compile, try to rationalize some effects we see so on in the, in the um, 3D atom probe. The question here was clearly um, whether we could rationalize the, the rhenium pileup at the interface. Um, so we did the simulation again using a phase field model, but only in 1D. Just to cut that story short a little bit, here we have a very quantitative comparison between the um, concentration profiles we got out of the, the, so the atom probe, um, which are the, the Wrigley lines, and the um, smooth lines representing the results from the phase field simulation. We found that during the cooling of the sample, which was meant to be a fast cooling, the interface had moved just a few nanometers, really. It's not very much, um, but it had moved, and that's little movement was sufficient to build up a pileup ahead of the moving interface, which would perfectly explain the variation and concentrations that we saw in the atom probe data. So here, chromium and cobalt inside the gamma phase of bottom, aluminum is very good, moly is quite good, 
There's some discrepancy for um, cobalt inside the gamma prime phase, but having spoken to the people who have done the 3D atom probe saying, yeah, but cobalt's a bit difficult to detect sometimes, so that could actually be an error in the detection as well. Um, so we didn't follow this up very much, but with the rest of that, it, it clearly stated, um, con well, supported our case that the pileups are due to the movement of the interface. I just skipped that one. This one I'd like to show where we use the same concepts on a very in a very, very different context. This is for silver, copper and phase separation appearing in that, trying to rationalize when we have nanoparticles in, in, in the silver copper system, when they're very small, they form what's called a core shell configuration with copper in the center and silver forming a, um, um, a layer on the surface. If they get bigger, they transform into a genus type particle where one side is copper, the other is silver. And we try to understand whether this is really a size effect and whether we could develop a model that would allow us to move into bike phases as well. So this is using the father of most phase field theory, the Carnelian theory, and we simulated the separation and evolution of the particles. And, um, and what we clearly see when the particles are small, they form a core shell um, structure with a red layer on top of a blue core. As they get bigger, the core moves towards the side and, and the largest particle in the end have clearly genus types um, configuration, but they're also not spherical. They change the shape slightly. They have a dumbbell shape with, um, with a groove in between the two, which is as expected because of course that forms a triple point and then all the dihedral angle has to be fulfilled. And we have the, the um, competition between the different um, interfacial energies there. I'd like to move on to the new ideas we're developing at the moment. I'm a bit eager to show some of that as well. And I talked quite a long time already. So the motivation for that is really what happens, what, what is the next step in there? Where, where would we go next? Because everything I've presented so far has been working nicely. We can do a lot of these simulations already and, and we're quite happy with many of the results we're seeing. But there's certain things that we can't do. All of the processes that we've been studying so far and have been presenting are at very moderate heating and cooling rates or even isothermals. So the driving forces for phase transformations weren't really that big. And the assumption that the interface between the two phases that transform one into the other is an equilibrium is a rather good one. And that has served us really, really well for many, many years. But a number of processes have come up to become very, very popular where that's not the case. For example, additive manufacturing now uses cooling rates that in the 90s and before were exclusively achievable in rapid solidification experiments in lab, scale, in lab settings. And there it's been shown that we deviate from local equilibrium. We have partitioning of alloying elements that doesn't follow the phase diagram, but gets swallowed up by the growing solid during solidification at a much, much higher rate than we would see in a normal casting process. So the interface is out of equilibrium. So we're looking at off equilibrium processing. There's other examples in that as well, not just certification processes, but we could also come up with other ideas where we find that, yeah, but just doing perfectly just local equilibrium um, in, in the sense, or it might not be the best of ideas, or we might want to include other physics in the movement of the interface which might be more tricky if we base everything on the phase diagrams or the local equilibrium assumptions. So how can we develop phase field models that are more flexible in that sense so that we include other effects? And this is what I'd like to talk about next. In order to do so, I'd like to take a step back and remind ourselves how we model thermodynamics of a solution phase. This is for a liquid or simple straightforward FCC, for example. So in order to describe the free energy of that phase, we of course have a mixture of the two elements that we mix. It's just substituting one for the other. That's the black line in the diagram at the bottom. Then we've got the ILD entropy of mixing, so the configuration entropy. So there's no interaction in there. It's just the different ways we could arrange the atom on the crystal lattice. So there isn't even a free parameter in there that's described by the red line below. And then we have an excess term. And that excess term can describe whether we um, would find that um, an alloy 
shows interactions between the chemical elements that are either attractive or repulsive. And I'd like to restrict myself to attractive interactions because it's easier for the time being. So if we add all of these terms together, sorry, the, the green line or the green curve at the bottom do, represents the contribution of the excess term. And that's the simplest model we can think of for that. There's more complex models for that. Um, that's something for a discussion on another day. But if we add this three up, we actually get the blue dashed curve below. And the, the, the assumption is, and it's, it's a rather good one, that this is valid whether we are in equilibrium or not. This is describing simply the free energy if a given phase is at a given composition and a given temperature. And this is the foundation for all of the things that we follow, and that's very important to keep in mind. So this remains valid even if we're off equilibrium. So from that, we can then actually start combining curves of these, let's say here one for alpha phase, one for beta phase, we can define a common tangent. I'm sure we've all seen that at some point. And from the common tangent, we get our phase equilibrium. That's the basis for what's done in the Kaifert method and the appropriate software that uses the Kaifert method. In phase field, we've been using a similar approach as well in order to describe equilibrium in local um, or the, the local equilibrium approach but in phase field it was necessary to introduce an extra degree of freedom and that was a very big challenge to overcome in the early 2000s in order to get the coupling to the Kaifa databases to work and the solution to that was to move away from the common tangent but introduce parallel tangents so we got one tangent to the alpha phase one to the beta phase both have exactly the same slope so we have the difference in chemical potentials mu b in alpha and beta and mu a in alpha and beta is the same for both. That's a parallel tangent. And that introduces the extra degree of freedom and allows us to get to driving force in order to advance the phase field solution. So, but what happens now if we go off equilibrium? If we're off equilibrium, we release that constraint of parallel tangents. We assume that a phase is at any given composition somewhat I nearly said randomly, but somewhat arriving at the composition doesn't matter how we how the phase gets there, but somehow some in composition of a phase, and and that forms a tangent. And uh, if we form a tangent to that phase, we can then determine the corresponding chemical potentials. But there isn't a clear rule between that, so we find that how the chemical potentials between the two phases and the two elements actually relate or do not relate. So we find that here there's even a change in sign. We find if we take the, the difference between this and this one compared to the chemical potentials over here, one has a positive sign, the other has a negative sign. And definitely there's no equal chemical potentials in that. And the challenge now is to take that situation, use that in order to develop a model that can simulate the phase transformation, the movement of our interface um, from this situation and this condition, which is the most generic condition, the most generic condition we can think of at the moment. There's probably other things to come in the future, but right now that's the challenge. So how are we going to do that? This would probably justify a talk in its own right, but just in a nutshell. The idea I'm currently using is based, or it's very much inspired by a paper published in 2006 by Henrik Larsen, Henrik Strandlung and Mats Hillert, a metallurgical transaction. Um, so some of the ideas originate back from Hendrik Larsen actually visiting Birmingham in 2007, just exactly the same time when I moved to Birmingham. So for the sake of the of the phase field approach, we assume that any point somewhere in our calculation domain can be represented by a small volume. And if that's part of the interface, we have two phases present, alpha and beta. And these phases are diffused in the spirit of phase field. So in, in the spirit of phase fields, this illustration here is actually not accurate, but for the sake of argument, the sake of understanding, I assume that we have something like a arbitrarily shaped face surrounded by a matrix. So we know the compositions of both phases, and um, if we know the compositions, we can calculate the chemical potentials. And when can you can also determine the area of the interface that separates the two phases. And it can be shown that relates to the magnitude of the gradient of the order parameter. And we know this from phase field, that's given from our phase field equation. If we combine all of that, 
we can actually calculate the rate at which atoms are crossing the interface from, let's say, the beta phase, uh, sorry, alpha phase onto the beta phase. So that means the, the blue phase will be growing and the um, orange phase will be shrinking. And we can relate that um, to an equation similar to this one, which has been derived using the absolute reaction rate theory and using that in order to describe the migration of an interface. And that was actually the achievement of that paper I mentioned earlier. From that, we actually get new phase compositions because we know how many atoms will cross the interface and we get an interface velocity. So we get a way to calculate by how much the interface would have moved and how much of one phase has transformed into the other. Just the challenge now is how to couple that into phase field. And I'm not going to go into the details because again, there's not enough time for that right now, but um, that's something I've been working on for quite some time now. It should be said, it is clear in here, we did make a local equilibrium assumption. We only made the assumption that the chemical potentials are always valid and we can calculate the chemical potentials from known compositions of the phases. We also find that extending this to multi-component is very, very straightforward because all we need to do is just having that equation that describes the, the flux. We need one of these for each element. So if we got a unary system, we would have one of them. If we had a binary, we had two. If we had a 20 component systems, we would have 20 of these equations. The computation effort would increase, of course, but the extension from a unary to a multi component system is extremely straightforward. So, how would that work in the phase field context? So, in the in the classical way, when we do the local equilibrium, we have a phase field equation and that would shift the phase field profile, representing a growth of a phase and the shrinking of another phase. For each point within that interface, we would then take the local conditions, the overall composition and the phase fraction, go into our Gibbs energy diagram, and, um, and from that, we would then also get the new phase compositions. Once we have the new phase compositions, we can then combine them and we get a concentration profile across the interface, which we can then use in a diffusion equation to simulate transport. In our reaction rate model, we do this slightly differently. We use our existing order parameter profile phi. For each point in that profile, we can then use the, the, um, the magnitude of the order parameter and its gradient and magnitude of the gradient to evaluate the um, direction well, the um, migration of inter um, atoms or species across the interface. So we simulate the growth and the change in composition. And this is what I'd like to call the reaction rate step. Once we've got that, we now have an updated composition profile for any point in the interface. And once we have the composition profile, we can use that in order to update the order parameter. So the order parameter is following the composition profile rather than leading it. Prakash, you're probably trying to remember me, remind me of the coming to an end. I'm nearly there. Um, so this is summarizing it. The most important bit is really that in the, in the new approach, the um, Composition is leading and the order parameters following. And I think that's that's a very different way of doing it. So I'd just like to show a few first results. So this was actually a week old. <laughs> so here we have a particle. We see here is the order parameter. The particles at the same composition of the matrix, and all I'm doing is now applying the curvature. So just the interface, which is working towards shrinking the particle, and then use the reaction rate step in order to redistribute elements in, in that spirit and find how do the elements within the particle or the, the how does the matter in the particle redistribute. And as the particles at the same composition of the matrix, we find once a particle disappeared, there is no trace of the particle. But I should point out, this was a four ternary alloy, okay? It's for ternary, for ternary system. Um, whether that's experimentally validatable, it's a different story. It's a discussion for another day. Here, on the other hand, is um, a system where I start with a small particle, include the thermodynamic interaction, and simulate the growth of the particle. And we see the particle growing, it's segregating. Up here is the total concentration profile around this, and, um, and the element segregates. And down here, we have the composition profiles in the particle um, and the matrix themselves. So, so we get a response, the particle is growing and following that. 
we're not fully there. I still see a number of problems to solve in that and, and some things I'm working on, but I think we're on the right track with that. Well, and that brings me to my last slide conclusion um, and some final thoughts. So we have a powerful tool combining face with thumb and modeling and a diffusion and it goes very insight um, very into a lot of problems. Um, we had a lot of success with that for many examples, but I also talked about a few future challenges and a few recent developments that things we're working on. And I personally find the idea of working towards a way of simulating non-equilibrium transformations in all kinds of shapes or including other physics into that very, very fascinating. And I assume that's something I will be well pursuing in, in, in the near future. Thank you very much for your patience and your attention. And um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Niels. Uh, wonderful talk. Uh, and uh, I request uh, anyone who has any questions to ask Niels. Yes, Carl. Hey Niels, you're okay. Hi Carl, yeah, nice to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Um, firstly, I really enjoyed the Mexican wave metaphor. That was that was, <laughs> that was really fun. Um, I, I guess my question is more from a, a a practical point of view. Is that how much confidence when you make small changes to compositions are you that the the, the differences you see in your phase field model are real? as opposed to maybe some of the fitting values that you've had to use for interfacial energies and such like I, I, I think it, it always comes always comes back to how 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 heavily fitted you are or what assumptions you have to make in terms of how much things change it very 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 much depends i mean for the super alloys for example many of the single crystal alloys put, contain 0.1 or less weight percent of hafnium. So that's very, very little. Given that hafnium is a relatively light element in those alloys, the, the uh, and um, quite commonly it's ignored in the simulations. I've done a few simulations where I've included it and it made a massive difference. Very, very noticeable. Um, on other simulations, throwing in another element, uh, we might have just left it out as well. It didn't make any difference at all. Um, that's down to the thermodynamics very, very often. Um, if you find there's an element that's very active in altering interfacial energy, then of course you need to take that into account, but then you need to know how that affects it. So in other words, there is no simple answer to that and saying that, yes, generally it's like that or like that. It, it's very, very, very case specific. Um, I'm afraid. No, that's, no, no, that's fine. No. I, I, and and when, when, yeah, that, I think that's, that's the best thing. Once you, once you become familiar with a family of alloys, you know which ones you can uh, yeah, oh, yeah, ignore yeah. and which ones, which, which ones are important. Yeah, yeah, but really, yeah. really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Claire? Thanks. Thanks very much, Niels. Hi, Claire. Hi there. Perhaps I can follow on from Carl's question. And I think that one of the things that we become more and more aware of is the stuff that we don't understand. And one of the things that I don't think we understand very well is the synergistic effects of having yeah. elements there that interact with each other. So, yeah. you, you know, you can even do binaries, but then as soon as you go into complex systems and they interact with each other, depending on their concentration. So it's not mm -hmm. just a, um, you can take a single additive or not quite mm. you know, non-linear additive type effect. How do you, can you deal with that, those? And what do you see to the future of the phase field model for how that would be included? I think a lot of that, well, it depends on which approach you're looking at to some extent as well. Um, I think there's there's no simple answer to that question again, but, uh, but if, if you, do the classical approach where you do the parallel tangent, some of them might have not as much effect as you would think. In other cases, um, when the, the approach I presented towards the end, the chemical potentials will include those effects. And they will also include the effect if you have a pileup of an element at the interface, it will slow down the interface and well, lead to something like solute drag because it will affect the chemical potential and the potential gradients and it will affect some elements more than others. And those, those cross terms are in there, but they're coming out of the thermodynamics and potentially the mobility coefficients as well. Um, 
and then the transients will start a big to play a big role where the parallel tangent is the state that what I, I would expect to see for the final steady state. So if we force our phase sweep model to be parallel tangents all the time, then we assume that, yeah, the conditions that we would find in a steady state would also apply in the transients. And, um, and, and this is where I'm personally not 100% convinced that this is the right way forward. So um, I feel like I'm going off a bit of a tangent here on relative to your question, but, but it always comes down in the end to saying that to go a couple of things. We, we are very heavily reliant on the thermodynamics to be as accurate as possible because we need to take that into account. If that is simplified and that one, the thermodynamics doesn't take into account so much interactions, we can do whatever we like. We can try to flange them onto our models then as well, but um, somehow they, they need to be in there. And um, if the phase field model itself, sorry, the phase field model itself will not necessarily get those transient in there unless the, um, the, the thermodynamics allows it to. Does that address your question, or am I? <laughs> no, I, I think I think that that he, that helps, and mm. it certainly points the direction for how. And I think you know you, your comments about it relies on the thermodynamic data yeah. is absolutely yeah. right, and the quality of that data yeah. and um one of the things we're seeing now that as as we go to alloy systems that are less common so mm -hmm. things with residual elements in steels because we know we're going to be producing more steels that are going to have residual elements the the question is on the accuracy of that kind of data yes. uh, and and then it it becomes challenging when we know we've got models that can predict things, but then mm. you don't have the confidence in those models and knowing mm. when you do and when you don't. So it's yeah. quite it's an interesting um, topic in yeah. terms of how we get there. Anyway, thank it, you very it, much. It, yeah, you're welcome. I mean, the the ability to um, model Kalfa databases is a dying skill in the UK. There's just not many people left that can do that, and um, some of them are on postcode contracts which come to an end at some point. So, um, and I think. UK used to be quite a leading place for that, but um, not anymore, unfortunately. Okay, uh, thank you. Jockey? Hi, hi, uh, Professor Neil. Hi. I'm Jia Chidong from uh, WNG oh. Research Fellow. So uh, okay. thanks for your hi. talk. Uh, yep. and, uh, you mentioned that during the non-equilibrium modeling, you assume local equilibrium, and the assumption, as you mentioned, is uh, com parallel tangent. I'm wondering, is that a, a valid assumption? Because as you also mentioned, the tangent can have different uh, slopes for, for different phases. And 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 the following that is, uh, uh, since you haven't achieved after the uh, cooling, you haven't achieved uh, full equilibrium, uh, yeah. that means there will be uh, extra energy will be dissipated. So where do you think in those systems the energy will be dissipated so not f so that not for equilibrium has been achieved? Thanks. Okay, there's two things. Um, doing the, the the standard phase field model that are presented the, where it's shown all of the examples for that one has been using the parallel tangents. The um, approach I presented towards the end has not been using parallel tangent, but instead simply using the actual chemical potential to drive the flux of atoms across the interface. So during the non-equilibrium modeling, we don't do parallel tangents anymore. I, I, I want to get rid of from away from parallel tangents uh, for a number of reasons. Um, so we, we stopped that local equilibrium assumption. Your other question is then, of course, we do the cooling the material is homogeneous is not homogeneous. It has microsegregation and it had phases which wouldn't be there in equilibrium. So that means there is a lot of energy stored in the system that gets released during the heat treatment, and this is what's driving the diffusion of the elements across the um, the structure. Um, so that energy gets dissipated during the the solution heat treatment when we activate the diffusion, the um, equilibration of the concentration gradients, and the dissolution of the um, the unstable phases. But it needs to be kept in mind, and that's very important to keep in mind. At a moving boundary between, let's say, the gamma and the gamma prime phase, that interface is still assumed to be in equilibrium locally, and that assumption is for for those very slow processes that are presented at the beginning rather good one it works quite well um 
but it's an assumption that we force onto the system as well. Okay. Does, okay. does that answer your question? Okay, thanks. I can ask another question. So yes. uh, I'm 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 looking at the as Claire already mentioned, I'm mm. looking at the residuals on the uh, phase transformation. Mm. So have we ever considering doing the uh, solid phase transformations using the phase field model? Is oh, that yeah, a, yeah. A doable? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, we we have. I mean, I showed some examples. The um, solution heat treatment is a solid state phase transformation, and there was the example of showing the um, the gamma prime. Had, um, growth coarsening and where the particles aligned into rows and columns. Um, that both of those were solid state transformations. Yes, yes. And uh, for for example, the um, in the steel FCC to BCC phase transformations, considering the uh, like uh, a residual elements. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah yes, 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 yes. Um, alpha beta, so ferrite austenite transformation has been done quite a lot. I didn't show anything of that because I've done very very little on that myself. Um, mm -hmm. But um, it's 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 something where a lot of people have been working on that. Um, there are some other challenges in there. Of course, there the, you then um, got the non-local equilibrium partitioning and all of that stuff. So um, that will be something interesting to look a bit more into as well. So that, uh, yeah. but um, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, uh, one last question, if I may. So, yes, if, please, if, yeah. if you, yeah, uh, yeah in, in the in the model, when we don't talk, think about the phase transformation, we only think about the ground growth. In the model, uh, mm. can you predict like, uh, how do you say, continuous ground growth or abnormal ground growth, and in which scenario we ex expect the abnormal grains, ground growth in the phase field modeling? Okay. I know it has been done. There are some people that have been looking into that. This is not an area I've looked at myself. Um, I, I, honestly, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I can't answer your question. Um, I know where to look and I know which, for which authors to look. Um, so if, if you want some some guidance, um, give me a call. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. But, um, but... okay. Okay, thanks. I will, I will send you an email and... Uh... Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, um, interesting. Any interesting questions, anybody? N Nils, if uh, uh, yep. you you show an atom probe tomography yes. uh, measurements, right? Did you do it in uh, UK, Oxford, or uh... no, 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 no? Um, that was done by a friend of mine, Alessandro Matura, and oh, okay. he was at Oak Ridge for that, um, doing his PhD. So it's been a while. Um, what, I forgot his name, but, but yeah, anyway, it wasn't done at Oak Ridge. Oh, okay. But, but, uh, you said that alloy has rhenium, right? Yes. Did you see in the atom probe, uh, rhenium segregation? Oh, yes. It, yeah, oh, okay. yes, 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 we saw. I mean, that, okay. that curve I shown showed, showed the rhenium peak at the interface. That, that was actually the, the big question where the rhenium peak was coming from. That, that was the, the very basic question we tried to address. Um, it wasn't about validating phase field. It was the other way around, using phase field in order to understand the peak and rationalize where the peak was coming from. It was a good case where this was a yes, no type of question being asked and showing that the simulation would actually answer that. Oh, okay, good, good. 